if we decide to do this thing, we can do it successfully. And there's also no doubt in my mind that the whole world hangs in the balance. Hello, I'm Benjamin Runkle, author of Generals in the Making, How Marshall, Eisenhower, Patton, and Their Peers Became the Commanders Who Won World War II, a group biography of the lives and careers of America's World War II generals during the interwar years. As the subtitle suggests, my book has a significant focus on General George C. Marshall and how his experience as Pershing's senior aide in the War Department in China, uh, leading the Benin Revolution at infantry school and overseeing, overseeing the Civilian Conservation Corps during the Great Depression helped to shape his leadership as chief of staff, both in the years mobilizing for World War II and during the war itself. Now, to me, the story of Marshall's interwar years actually begins on September 8th, 1919, as the USS Leviathan approached the Eastern Seaboard. During World War I, the Leviathan had transported over 100,000 doughboys to France. But now, on her final voyage westward across the Atlantic, one passenger towered above all the others. General John J. Pershing had, was awakened at 7 a.m. that morning by a cacophony of whistles and sirens emanating from the motley flotilla of boats streaming out from New York Harbor to welcome the conquering hero who had led the two million soldiers of the American Expeditionary Force to victory in the war to end all wars. From the Leviathan's deck, Pershing, his 10-year-old son Warren, his staff officers watched in amazement as the, at the mass of ships and people. An honor guard of tugboats circled the great ship, escorting the Leviathan toward Hoboken, tooting their horns and wildly spraying jets of water into the air. At 8 a.m., a Navy destroyer maneuvered alongside, bearing VIPs such as the Secretary of War, the Army Chief of Staff, the chairman of the Senate Military Affairs Committee, and other congressmen and former AEF staffers. Another vessel carried the mayor of New York City, Pershing's two sisters, his nephew, and the families of his officers. As the Leviathan sailed past Ambrose Light, Ambrose Light planes, planes flew overhead, guns fired, and sirens screamed the news of Pershing's arrival to the awaiting city. Pershing was overwhelmed at the size and enthusiasm of the welcome and modestly replied that the raucous reception was not for him alone, but, quote, for all those Americans whom I had the honor to command. When the ship docked, floods of news, newsmen and photographers crowded aboard and hundreds of pictures were taken. In the photos, the tall, broad, deep-chested general with white hair and steely eyes is beaming and gesticulating at the pandemonium around him. Garnering little attention that day was the reserved colonel with deep set blue eyes and sandy hair standing behind Pershing. The officer had only become an aide to the general a few months earlier and hadn't served in the trenches nor performed any conspicuous acts of bravery under fire to attract the attention of military correspondents eager to promote heroes to the American public. Yet it would be hard to disagree with the assertion that Pershing's quiet aide was in fact the most important officer standing on Pier 4 in Hoboken that day. For in 20 years, George Catlett Marshall would be asked to recruit, train, and deploy an army more than twice the size of the AEF and against enemies that had already conquered most of Europe and East Asia. President Harry S. Truman would say of Marshall's role as U.S. Chief of Staff, U.S. Army Chief of Staff during World War II, quote, millions of Americans gave their country outstanding service, George C. Marshall gave it victory, and British Prime Minister Winston Churchill would describe Marshall as the organizer of victory. Now, although in retrospect, history often appears to have unfolded in a straight line, reality is almost always more chaotic and uncertain. It's easy to view the photographs of Marshall standing behind Pershing on the Hoboken docks, or or of George Patton standing next to a tank in 1918, know what they achieved in building and leading the U.S. Army in World War II, and therefore perceive their rise as inevitable. But that generation of officers' eventual triumphs were, en were anything but predetermined. So today, I'd like to discuss two aspects of George Marshall's rise to Ch Army Chief of Staff that I think tend to get overlooked in the conventional narratives of his career, specifically the role that luck and resolve played in, played in his career. Now, there's a tendency 
I'm, I'm, to hear somebody describe someone as someone else as having been lucky and interpret this as a dismissal of their abilities. But this isn't really the case in military matters where there's more respect for the role that providence or fortune plays in even the greatest commander's careers. In On War, for example, Clausewitz observed that, quote, no other human activity is so continuously or universally bound up with chance. And though the element and through the element chance, guesswork and luck come to play a great part in war. Napoleon may not have been the first to say that he preferred lucky generals, but his underlying point about the importance of good fortune in creating opportunities for brilliant commanders to seize is generally accepted. And as the legendary British cavalryman, General Sir Edmund Allenby once told George Patton, for every Napoleon and Alexander who made history, quote, there were several born, only the lucky ones made it to the summit. You had to be at the right place at the right time. You had to be lucky. Allenby's assessment is particularly relevant, I think, in Marshall's case. For when he matriculated at VMI in 1897, his dream of obtaining an army commission was far from guaranteed. At the time, the Institute had fewer than a dozen graduates, a dozen graduates in the United States Army. Yet Marshall's timing was fortuitous. For just as he was graduating in 1901, the regular army was undergoing its first major expansion since the Civil War, increasing from 25,000 to 100,000 men to deal with the Philippine insurrection. It therefore needed an additional 1,200 commissioned officers. Even then, Marshall still had to spend months petitioning politicians, including a personal visit to President William McKinley, merely to be allowed to go before an examining board. By then, there were 10,000 applicants for the new commissions and only 142 positions remaining. Marshall, however, achieved one of the highest scores on the three-day exam and on January 4th, 1902, received his commission as a second lieutenant. So in other words, luck put Marshall in the right place for his talent to earn a commission. For Marshall to even get to that point where his talent could come to bear, however, he required another sort of luck. During his senior year at VMI, Marshall was the unanimous choice for first captain, the school's highest ranking cadet officer. As one biographer noted, his selection was, not, was a tribute, quote, not to his brains, but to his prowess as a precision machine. Indeed, Marshall's record in military discipline was unequaled. In four years as a cadet, he didn't receive a single demerit. One day, however, he was walking through Lexington when he heard a piano emanating from a cottage just outside VMI's gates, playing songs that Marshall's mother had played when he was young. He frequently returned to the cottage to sit outside and listen to the music, but it took some time before he summoned the courage to approach the house and introduce himself to the young lady whose music had surprised him. Yet when Miss Lily Coles invited him in, it was love at first sight. Lily was considered the belle of Lexington, but at 26, she remained unmarried due to her condition, her quote unquote condition, which was a vaguely, vaguely diagnosed heart problem that limited her physical activities. In order to visit Lily more frequently, the disciplined marshal risked his rank and his dream of becoming an army officer by sneaking out at night from VMI. He recalled years later, quote, I was very much in love and I was willing to take the chance. So in addition to the fortuitous timing of graduating during a period of army expansion, Marshall was also lucky that he wasn't caught by any, by any of VMI's gate guards. Marshall's luck continued during World War I. When Pershing assumed command of the AEF, which was created and deployed to France after America entered World War I in April 1917, he essentially had to create and organize an army from scratch. During the summer and fall of 1917, with few other units yet to reach France, Pershing took an inordinate interest in the first American unit to arrive, the 1st Division. As the division conducted training in Lorraine, Pershing frequently visited its headquarters on short notice to check on its progress. A review with the French president on September 6, 1917 was a disaster, and Pershing took out his frustration on the division's commander, Major General William L. Cyber. Pershing inspected the division again on October 3rd, this time at Gondricourt, to watch a demonstration of a new method of attacking an entrenched enemy. After the demonstration, Pershing called upon Seibert for a critique. And although Seibert possessed a brilliant record as an engineer, he had little experience with infantry tactics and had only witnessed the demonstration for the first time alongside Pershing. Consequently, his comments were halting and confused. Pershing then called upon two other staff officers whose replies were equally unsatisfying. 
general erupted and just gave everybody hell. Pershing especially excoriated Cyber in front of his own officers, questioning his leadership, his attention to details and training, and his acceptance of such poor professionalism. Now, the First Division staff felt a possessive affection for their commander, and as Pershing turned to leave, Marshall, who as a major had been serving as the division's acting chief of staff, spoke up and angrily protested Pershing's unfairness. Pershing was in no mood to listen and began to walk away. Suddenly he felt Marshall's hand grabbing his arm. Now think about the audacity of this moment. Not only having the guts to contradict a senior officer, but the nerve to actually lay hands on the commanding general to make sure he hears your point. Marshall said, quote, he said, General Pershing, there's something to be said here, and I think I should say it because I've been here the longest. Indeed, he was the second person off the boat. Pershing turned back and gave the impertinent officer, a, a impertinent young officer, a cold, praising glance. What have you got to say? Torn of facts pour, poured forth. The promised platoon manuals that, never, that had never arrived and had set back training. The inadequate supplies that left men walking around with gunny sacks on their feet. The inadequate quarters that left troops scattered throughout the countryside, sleeping in barns for a penny a night, and the lack of motor transport that forced troops to walk miles to the training grounds before they even could start training. Finally, Marshall's deluge subsided. Pershing looked at him and calmly said, you must appreciate the troubles we have. Marshall replied, yes, I know you do, General, I know you do, but ours are immediate and every day and have to be solved before night. Pershing eyed Marshall narrowly and then turned to leave. The First Division staff looking, basically looking nervously at the ground in stunned silence. After a while, Seibert gratefully told Marshall, hey, you shouldn't have stuck your neck out on your account for me like that. And the rest of the staff predicted that Marshall's military career was finished. Marshall just shrugged off his friend's condolences and said, all I can see is that I may get troop duty instead of staff duty, and certainly that would be a great success. Yet no retribution for the incident ever came. Whenever Marshall, when, instead, whenever Pershing, divi, Pershing visited First Division thereafter, he would find a moment to pull Marshall aside and ask how things were really going. Pershing had finally found an officer who would tell him the unvarnished truth rather than gloss over inadequacies. Marshall eventually received orders transferring him to the AEF General Staff to work under General Fox, or, excuse me, Colonel Fox Connor, the head of the operations section. Together, they would form the core of the group that planned the two great U.S. offensives of the war, St. Mihail and the Meuse Argonne. Pershing was impressed and after the armistice asked Marshall to become his aide. I think that, as with the, as with the VMI and the commissioning, this episode, this episode illustrates how luck and talent work hand in hand. Very few generals would have tolerated Marshall's public dissent as Pershing did. Marshall was lucky that Pershing was the rare leader who valued the honesty, judgment, and moral courage that Mar Marshall demonstrated at Gondricourt. Otherwise, he would not have benefited from the exposure as, uh, to such issues as mobilization and logistical issues, an in-depth review of the Army's personnel procedures, and working with Congress and the War Department leaders that came from later serving as Pershing's aide when Pershing became Army Chief of Staff after the war. These experiences would, of course, reap enormous benefits when it came time to organize and build an army, Marshall himself doing this 20 years later. Once again, like VMI, this would all not have been possible without a lucky escape during the war. At around 10.30 a.m., November 11th, 1918, Marshall was in the mess for a late breakfast. As the officers debated what should be done to Germany after the armistice set to begin in half an hour, a bomb unexpectedly exploded in the garden 10 yards from where they sat. Marshall was thrown against the wall, stunned. He recalled, quote, I thought I'd been killed. He ended up on the floor, a nasty bump on his head. Moments later, a young aviator rushed in, apologizing profusely. One last bomb stuck in its rack and shaken loose just as he was about to land on the other side of the headquarters building. As historian Stanley Weintraub observes, had the walls of the old house been less sturdy, a different chief of staff would have led the American armies against the Germans in the next war. Now, again, although fortune smiled on Marshall at key moments, I don't want to give the impression that Marshall's legacy is entirely due to luck. 
In addition to his intelligence and industry, I would argue that his strength of character or his resilience was key to making him the general he became as he endured trials, especially during the interwar years that would have discouraged and broke, even broken a lesser man. Although we tend to place the Army's World War II commanders on pedestals as almost Olympian figures, in reality, during the interwar years, they endured numerous personal difficulties that would be recognizable today. Divorce, depression, PTSD, personal frust professional frustrations, and financial troubles. Marshall was no exception, and I actually think that makes his and the other future general's achievements all the more impressive. In Marshall's case, he had to endure the horrible disconnect between his abilities and the Army's promotion system. During the 15 years after his commissioning, for example, Marshall held nearly every significant staff job in the Army, establishing a reputation for brilliance. In 1906, as a second lieutenant, Marshall attended the General Services and Staff School at Fort Leavenworth. Although all other 53 officers in this course were senior to him in rank and experience, Marshall graduated first in his class. The faculty board, uni faculty board unanimously selected him as one of the five student officers to remain as an instructor, even though he would be outranked by all of his students. In January 14, despite being a junior lieutenant, Marshall effectively commanded nearly 5,000 men during Philip maneuvers in the Philippines. During the exercise, Lieutenant Henry Hap Arnold, who of course would rise to become Chief of Staff of the U.S. Air Forces in World War II, saw Marshall examining a map and dictating orders under the shade of a bamboo grove. Arnold was so impressed that he wrote his wife to tell her he had just seen a future Chief of Staff in action. In 1916, when asked on Marshall's performance evaluation whether he would like to have the junior officer serve under his command, Lieutenant Colonel Johnson Haygood, a future Major General himself, replied, quote, yes, but I would prefer to serve under his command. This deep respect and praise for, from his peers notwithstanding, Marshall grew increasingly frustrated with the Army. The pace of advancement within the officer corps was so glacial that Marshall was not promoted to captain until the age of 35 in August 1916, nine years after he became a first lieutenant, 14 years after being commissioned. Just for comparison, generally today, it takes four years to reach captain. The lack of opportunities for advancement, despite his, the, uh, his obvious merit, had Marshall considering leaving the Army, and in October 1915, he wrote to General E.W. Nichols, the superintendent of BMI. He wrote, quote, the absolute stagnation in promotion in the infantry has caused me to make tentative plans for resigning as soon as business conditions improve. The prospects for advancement in the Army are so restricted by law and the accumulation of large numbers of men nearly the same age, all in a single grade, that I do not feel it right to waste all my best years in the vain struggle against insurmountable difficulties. General Nichols replied, quote, I am sure in time you will be among the high-ranking officers in the service. Nichols convinced Marshall to stay in the Army, and as we all know, over the next day, decade, Marshall's resiliency paid off. He served with great distinction during the war, became Persian senior aide when the general became Army Chief of Staff, and served as executive officer of the prestigious 15th Infantry Regiment in Tianjin, China from 1924 to 1927. It was in 1927, however, that Marshall encountered the tragedy instead of luck. Upon completing his tour in Tianjin, Marshall was assigned to the Army War College as an instructor, an assignment he had previously turned down five times. Although Lily was overjoyed by this assignment and looked forward to decorating her new home at the Washington Barracks with the, with the vases, the rugs, um, screens, and wall hangings they had accumulated in China, Marshall dreaded exchanging duty with the troops for a desk job in the big city. Adding to his concerns was Lily's deteriorating health. She'd never been robust, but by August 1927, the heart condition that had plagued her throughout her life had worsened alarmingly. The doctors at Walter Reed determined that a goiter thyroid was aggravating her condition and required a long, extremely serious operation on August 22nd. Marshall spent his days teaching from 9 a.m. to 4.30 each day, then racing across town to be with Lily from 6 p.m. on. Lily wrote her aunt, quote, George is so wonderful and helps me so. 
He puts heart and strength in me. Her doctors were optimistic and expected a full recovery. Lily agreed and told Marshall she felt healthier and stronger than she had been in many years. Finally, early on the morning of September 15, the doctor told Lily she could go home the next day. Delighted at the news of her impending discharge, she started a letter to tell her mother the good news. Marshall had just begun his morning lecture when a guard entered the hall at 9 a.m. to call him to the telephone. Marshall spoke for a moment over the phone and put his head in his arms. The guard recalled, quote, I asked him if I could do anything for him, and he replied, no, Mr. Throckmorton, I just had word my wife, who was to join me here today, has just died. Lily Marshall never finished the letter to her mother. The nurse found her dead, slumped over her desk, the last word she wrote was George. Marshall was stricken. Lily had been the center of his life and virtually his only emotional release. Now she was gone and he was alone. At age 47, an age at which most men's destinies are pretty much fully shaped, Marshall's life was suddenly cast adrift. Pershing, who was a widower himself, come closest to understanding his protege's grief, wrote, my dear Marshall, no one knows better than I what such a bereavement means, and my heart goes out to you very fully at this crisis in your life. It is at such moments that we realize that our reliance must be placed in the Father who rules over us all. Marshall replied, quote, My dear General, your telegram was deeply appreciated and your letter even more so. The truth is, the thought of all you had endured gave me heart and hope. 26 years of most intimate companionship, something I have known ever since I was a mere boy, leaves me lost in my best efforts to adjust myself to future prospects in life. If I had not been given to club life, if I had been given to club life or other intimacies with men outside of athletic diversions, or if there was a campaign on or pressing duty, other pressing duty demanding a concentrated effort, then I think I could do better. However, I will find a way. For Marshall, that way was inevitably through mental and physical exertion. Yet in the void left by Lily's death, Marshall suddenly found his surroundings at the War College unbearable. He confided to a friend, at the War College desk, I thought I would explode. Fortunately, the Army rallied to its own. Chief of Staff Charles Summerall, under whom Marshall had served in the closing days of World War I, offered him a choice. He could remain at the War College, he could transfer to Governor's Island, New York to serve as Chief of Staff for a core area, or he could fill the race, recently vacated post of Assistant Commandant of the Infantry School at Fort Benning, Georgia. Marshall selected Fort Benning, and by early November, he left Washington, D.C. Although Marshall described the move to Benning as magical and gave him, quote, hundreds of interests, an unlimited field of activity, delightful associates, and all outdoors to play in, some pains cannot be escaped so easily. Shortly after Lily's death, even a strong-willed soul as Marshall let his guard down and confessed to a young friend, quote, Rose, I'm so lonely, so lonely. Although Marshall is commonly portrayed as this stoic, austere, aloof figure, this loneliness stayed with him at Benning, where the nights and weekends hung heavy on him. Despite the presence of friends like Joseph Stilwell and Forrest Harding, Marshall remained mired in the grip of personal tragedy. Every room in his house was filled with pictures of Lily, constantly reminding him of his loss. He strove not to be alone, and in his letters he was persistently imploring friends to visit him at Benning. Under the strain of constant work and his loneliness during his first years at Benning, Marshall lost weight and his lean, bony face became more drawn and plain than ever. Yet Marshall was resilient and he plunged enthusiastically into his new assignment at the infantry school. Brigadier General Campbell King, the school's commandant, was responsible for all of Fort Benning, and he gave Marshall considerable lat latitude in overhauling the infantry school's academic course. In what became known as the Benning Revolution, Marshall dramatically changed how infantry in officers were taught, prohibiting canned lectures and increasing field problems to about 80% of instruction. And he also changed how, as well what, what they were taught, emphasizing firepower, maneuver, and above all, creative thinking in place of formal orders and rigid adherence to doctrine. Historian Jörg Muth was extremely critical of professional military education and leadership de development in the interwar army, concludes, 
the only highlight of the U.S. Army's educational system in the first decades of the 20th century was the infantry school, and then only when George C. Marshall was the assistant commandant. Marshall also expertly mentored the officers under him at Benning. Omar Bradley, Stillwell, Light, Lightning Joe Collins, Charles Bolt, and Bradford Chinoweth were among the instructors Marshall would summon to his quarters for discussions on the art of leading men in battle. Marshall or Major Gilbert R. Cook, who would later command a corps under Patton in Europe, would assign a book or study, frequently on a non-military subject, such as psychology, sociology, or economics, and one or two of the group would deliver a report on the work's relevance to contemporary military problems. Indeed, in his memoirs, Bradley stated that, quote, no man had a greater influence on me personally or professionally. In all, 150 future generals attended the infantry school during Marshall's tenure, and another 50 served on the faculty. Equally important, Bradley thought, was, quote, was the imaginative training Marshall imparted to the countless hundreds of junior officers who passed through the school during this time and who would lead, often brilliantly, the regiments and battalions under the command of those generals. In other words, Marshall's misfortune, horrible as it was, ended up having an incredibly positive outcome for the Army in World War II because of Marshall's resilience. Another example of Marshall's extraordinary resilience came after his tenure at Fort Benning, when in October 1933, he received orders relieving him of command at Fort Moultrie, South Carolina, and transferring him to Chicago to be the senior instructor with the Illinois National Guard's 33rd Division. Now, no offense to National Guardsmen, past or present, thank you for your service, but this was a ridiculously rudimentary assignment for an officer who had led the Army's infantry school and marked a significant setback to Marshall's career. As Marshall vented to Pershing, quote, I've had the discouraging experience of seeing the man I relieved in France as G3 of the Army promoted years ago, and my assistant as G3 of the Army similarly advanced six years ago. In despair, for the first time in his career, Marshall asked to have his posting changed, and Pershing also appealed to the chief of staff, Douglas MacArthur. But MacArthur still bore a grudge against Pershing's staff for perceived slights during the war, and he had personally recommended Marshall for the backwater position. He told the general staff secretary, Robert Eichelberger, himself a future army commander in World War II, that Marshall, quote, will never be a brigadier general as long as I am chief of staff, and replied to Pershing with a curt, all requests refused. Marshall wrote resignedly to Pershing, quote, I can but wait, grow older, and hope for a more favorable situation in Washington. His second wife, Catherine, remembered that during those first months of exile in Chicago, quote, George had a gray, drawn look, which I had never seen before and have seldom seen since. His disappointment notwithstanding, Marshall continued mentoring his former subordinates. In October 1934, he advised a former infantry school instructor not to allow low rank and infrequent promotion to ruin his morale. He said, quote, keep your wits about you and your eyes open. Keep on working hard. Sooner or later, the opportunity will present itself. Similarly, Matthew Ridgway, who served under Marshall in China and attended the infantry school during Marshall's tenure, often sought Marshall's advice while serving as the operation officer for VI Corps and later as Second Army Chief of Staff based in Chicago. In the summer of 1936, Ridgway planned maneuvers in rural Illinois, which proved a brilliant success. Yet Ridgway had worked so intensely that at the operation's end, he collapsed in a bathroom from exhaustion and gashed his head. After the incident, Marshall congratulated Ridgway, but chided him about overwork, saying, quote, there is no need for you to demonstrate any further you are an energetic, able workman. He advised the young major to, quote, cultivate the art of playing and loafing and to establish the reputation of being something of a dilettante. Marshall took his own advice, of course. I mean, about the hard work and patience, that is. Nobody would ever have described him as being a dilettante and turned, to the, and turned the 33rd Division into the Marshall took his own advice, of course, about the hard work and patience, that is. 
nobody would ever have described him as being a dilettante. And he turned the 33rd Division into one of the best National Guard units in the country. He approached his duty with his usual, usual professionalism, and in the summer of 1934, federal inspectors found every unit of the 33rd at least satisfactory, the first time in years the division had passed muster. After observing Colonel Marshall for several months, the 33rd's commander, Brigadier General Roy Keane, went to see MacArthur in Washington and told him that Marshall was too gifted to be wasted in a guard position. Keene insisted Marshall be promoted to Brigadier General and give it, be given a challenge worthy of his talents. Finally, by 1936, Marshall was high enough on the seniority list and MacArthur was no longer chief of staff to receive what almost everyone realized was a long overdue, was a long overdue promotion. Within a few days of pinning on his first star, he received orders to take command of the 5th Infantry Brigade at Vancouver Barracks, Washington. In May 1938, Marshall received orders transferring him to the War Plans Division in Washington, D.C., where he benefited one more time from good fortune. When Marshall arrived in the Capitol, Chief of Staff Malin Craig confided to his friend that War Plans was only a temporary assignment and that Marshall was being groomed to become the next Deputy Chief of Staff. Craig was scheduled to retire as Chief of Staff on September 1st, 1939, and Marshall's name quickly emerged as a possible replacement. Although Omar Bradley, then serving in the War Department's G1, noted, quote, among the officers of my rank and age, there was universal agreement that Marshall was by far the best possible man for the job. Marshall was far, assured from, far from assured of attaining the position. Since the post was created in 1921, only one of the previous 11 deputies had been promoted to chief of staff. At age 57, Craig's retirement represented Marshall's last chance, after which he would lack the required four years to serve before he reached his own mandatory retirement. Marshall was outranked by all 20 of the Army's major generals, as well as by 11, 11 brigadier generals, although only four of those men had the requisite four years until mandatory retirement themselves. Consequently, Marshall ranked fifth in seniority behind four major generals, of whom his friend Hugh Drum was the clear frontrunner. Drum had been Pershing's first army chief of staff in France and was a major general by 1930 when Marshall was still lieutenant colonel. Drum had been a serious candidate for chief of staff when MacArthur was selected to the post in 1930 and again in 1935 when Craig was appointed. He had served as MacArthur's deputy chief of staff, commander of the Hawaiian division, and was currently commanding the first army in New York. Worse, Marshall appeared to have fatally undermined his chances of succeeding Craig during a meeting with President Roosevelt in November 1938. Spurred by action, or spurred to action by British and French appeasement at the Munich Conference and by intelligence reports that exaggerated German air superiority, FDR called a meeting on November 14 to lay out his program for addressing the rising threat to national, US national security. Marshall accompanied General Craig to the White House and sat on the outer edges of a meeting with other presidential aides and advisors. Marshall listened with the others as FDR dominated the discussion, proposing an air force of 20,000 planes and production capacity of 24,000 per year. Because Congress was sure to cut that figure, Roosevelt ordered Craig to begin planning a $500 million program for 10,000 planes, declaring, quote, had we this summer 5,000 planes and the capacity immediately to produce 10,000 per year, Hitler would not have dared to take the stance he did. FDR's plan, however, did not include requests for the pilots, crews, organizations, ground service, and maintenance facilities necessary for an actual functional air force. When the president finished, he went around the room asking each man for his opinion. Marshall remembered, quote, most of them agreed with him entirely and had very little to say and were very soothing. Finally, Roosevelt came to Marshall and said, don't you think so, George? Now, Marshall was not opposed to enlarging the Amer American air power or the president's emphasis on rapid development. He recognized, however, that without the enlistment and training of air crews and money for bases and other facilities, the president's plan was totally unbalanced and made little sense militarily. Marshall also bristled at Roosevelt's misrepresentation of their intimacy by using his first name. So he replied, I'm sorry, Mr. President, 
but I don't agree with that at all. The room went silent. FDR gave Marshall a startled look and abruptly dismissed the meeting. Now, just as with his confrontation with General Pershing at Gondra Court two decades earlier, as Marshall filed out of the room, they all, quote, they all bade me goodbye and said that my tour in Washington was over. But once again, the more timid souls had misjudged, had misjudged Marshall's fate. Roosevelt realized that Marshall, quote, would tell him what was what straight from the shoulder. Marshall also had influential supporters in Harry Hopkins, Mail and Craig, and of course, General Pershing. Thus, on Sunday, April 23rd, 1939, the president summoned Marshall to his second floor study in the White House to tell him he had decided in his favor. Once again, Marshall was fortunate to have found a leader who valued honesty and a constructive criticism, and constructive criticism, something that is still a rarity today. And of course, over the next two years, Marshall transformed the inadequately armed and equipped 170,000 man army into a force of 1.6 million officers and men in 36 divisions and almost 200 air squadrons. He, into a, he oversaw the passage of the first peacetime draft in American history, the federalization of the National Guard, the establishment of solid relations with the Congress, and even more remarkably, with the Navy, the distribution of war material to potential allies around the globe, and the creation of detailed manpower and industrial mobilization plans. As Russell Wigley concludes, during this period, Marshall became, quote, the principal military architect of the Western democracy's ultimate victory over the actor Axis powers. But for all Marshall's intelligence and talent, this achievement, again, was not preordained. In the decline and fall of the Roman emperor, Ed Edward, historian Edward Gibbon observed, quote, the fortune of nations has often depended upon accidents. A similar string of accidents and coincidences were vital to the allied victory in World War II. Although success in war is the product of countless variables, seen and unseen, it can plausibly be argued that without Eisenhower, without Bradley, Patton, Collins, Ridgway, and other key army and corps commanders, American and its allies would not have been able to defeat Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan. If so, then it could also be argued since none, that since none of these men would have held their commands, if not for George Marshall, either due to his direct intervention or because of his Herculean efforts to expand, train, and equip the army on the eve of World War II, victory would not have been possible without Marshall. It follows that victory in World War II but might, would have been less likely had Marshall been caught sneaking out of VMI at night to woo Lily and been expelled and never commissioned. If he'd graduated at a time when the army was still only 25,000 men strong, there simply wasn't a commission to be earned. If he'd encountered a commander without Pershing's tolerance for dissent, it had been in charge of the AEF, in which case Marshall would have either just served as just another major in the trenches and probably ne and never become a chief of staff's aide, or God forbid that that errant bomb on the morning of November 11th, 1918, had fallen 30 feet closer to the officer's mess. Similarly, if Marshall had not been as determined and resilient as he was, he could easily have done what many talented officers would do after the war and abandon the army for civilian life in 1915. He could have understandably been able to, unable to function and nobody would have blamed him if he'd been unable to continue in the army in the wake of his beloved Lily's death instead of revolutionizing US infantry training and mentoring the men who would serve as the army's battalion, brigade, division, corps, and even army commanders during the war or if he had become discouraged with the army when he was exiled by Douglas MacArthur. Without luck at key moments or the resilience as he endured personal tragedy and personal setbacks, Marshall would not have been in a position to build the forces that defeated fascism in World War II. Thank goodness he was. As Eisenhower wrote to him after the Germany's surrender, quote, our army and people have never been so indebted to any soldier. And as Bradley wrote, quote, in the army, we often scoff at the myth of the indispensable man. General Marshall, however, was an exception. For if ever a man was indispensable in time of national crisis, he was that man. And it was, he was that man in that position because of his luck and because of his resilience. I'd like to thank the George C. Marshall Foundation for their assistance in arranging this virtual book talk.
um, particularly Melissa Davis, Glenn Carpenter, and Paul Barron. I'd also like to thank the staff of the research library for their assistance when I was actually writing, researching and writing Generals in the Making. I'd also like to thank all the patrons of the foundation for your support of the library. If we'd been able to hold this event in person, I would have found a way to talk about how much emphasis how much emphasis uh, Marshall and his contemporaries put on the study of military history as an important component of, component of leadership development. Marshall placed such a great emphasis on reading that he gave the infantry school's librarian $10,000 per year at a time during the Great Depression when funds were scarce for the purchase of books in order to build up Benning's military library. I think that all of these officers would be smiling appreciatively at the great work done at the Marshall Library and, and through events such as this. And finally, someday somebody will be viewing this lecture and this talk in a post-COVID pandemic world. But until then, I hope everybody continues to stay safe and healthy. Thank you.